It is time for episode 26 of the Justice Sec podcast. And in this episode, I get the chance to chat with someone I became enamored with before I was even 10 years old and before he was anywhere close to being able to drive. One of the newest Rangers for the 2020 season is a guy known as the Todd Father, Todd Frazier. But he burst onto the scene not as a Major League All-Star with the Cincinnati Reds or a home run derby champ, but years and years before when he helped lead the Tom's River East New Jersey team to the Little League World Series title in front of 40-plus thousand fans in Williamsport and however many more watching on ESPN and ABC around the world. I was just a little kid then, and I saw this 12-year-old with braces play shortstop and pitch and be the star player, and I was like, I like that guy. Well, lo and behold, Todd went on to Rutgers, had a standout career there, and then on to professional baseball where he made his debut as a Cincinnati Red and has spent time with the White Sox, the Yankees, the Mets, and he's now a part of the Texas Rangers organization. I was excited to get the chance to chat with Todd about his Little League World Series experiences and maybe a funny moment that took place before he became a known commodity in America. His journey along the way, growing up in New Jersey, his professional journey, penchant for big home runs, love of sports, and more. As always, you can find all the interviews for the Justice Sec podcast on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash SandlerJ1. And I would really appreciate if you would take the time to subscribe. It's free. You can also like the interviews and comment on them. If maybe you've got thoughts on what was shared, I also have other videos on there, sports commentaries, uh, just hanging interviews, which are a little more off the wall, a little goofy, and more fun and yucks on the YouTube channel. I'd really appreciate it if you would check it out. But, alas, episode 26 of the Just a Sec podcast with Todd Frazier. All right, Todd, so I kind of want to somewhat start at the beginning. I I know you have older brothers and and I have older brothers and I know the influence they had on me. I'm curious what sort of an influence your brothers had on you as you were growing up, both as an athlete and just as a, as an individual. Yeah, pretty much everything. I mean, when I started speech and talk to young kids or a group of people, I always say how grateful I am to have two older brothers because basically I learned from them. I wanted to break their records. I wanted to be everything that they did. And I learned from them, man. The biggest thing, I always watch when, you know, not only when they did good, but I put an extra eye on when they did bad. And I'd ask questions. I'd say, hey, what happened in that situation? And now when I got older, I understood, you know, when it came down to, when it, came down to it, I knew what to do in that situation. And I was well prepared. So for me, at a young age, I learned that really quickly. And uh, my brothers taught me everything I know pretty much. What were you guys most competitive about growing up? Was it, I mean, like, was there a family game, a board game, or, or something that, like, if you guys were in the same room playing it when someone lost, like, uh oh, you better watch out? Yeah, I, <laughs> that's funny that you say that. Uh, I think ping pong was the biggest one. Our dad got us a ping pong table for Christmas one year. And I remember, like, the first three months, I actually finally beat my older brother, Charlie. I was, I'm a pretty good ping pong player, and. He elbowed the corner of the ping pong table, <laughs> and my dad came walking by and looked. He said, "All right, well, I guess you got, um, you know, two thirds of the ping pong table now. Good luck." So, and then that was that was it. So we played basically like that, and he wanted to play on the other side because he knew that honestly dude, they didn't have much room to hit it over there. But yeah, it made it for fun times, but a lot of holes in the walls. If, if you know what I mean. Uh, who uh, I think I read something where. There was some debate, uh, a friendly debate, who the real best athlete in the family is or was. So I, I think I might know your answer to this, but who's the best athlete in the family? Yeah, I mean, shoot, I think I'm the best athlete in the family. But listen, I, I'll go to this. Charlie, my brother Charlie, who played professional with the Marlins, he was the best basketball player by far. I mean, this guy could shoot. If he didn't get injured for, uh, for two months in his high school career, he would have definitely uh, broke 2,000 points. He was a great shooter. Um, my brother Jeff, uh, he was, um, you know, he was, he was a monster hitter. He can hit the ball far in baseball. You know, we just played basketball and baseball when we got into high school. Uh, I played football my freshman year. I would say I, I was the football star and baseball star. And 
those two have to fight out the second place. So <laughs> I, I, I had them. I was like the mound around the rebound, Charles Barkley. You know, I like to give the ball. Those two were, were ball hogs. So, you know, I won't come to, I won't come to their face, but that's another story. <laughs> One of the things, and, and gosh, you know, the time we're having this conversation, the Rangers, uh, you know, haven't even played a regular season game. The time we've spent together is limited to to spring training, but, you know, I think 80% yeah. of our conversations have been about other sports, not baseball. You're a huge sports fan. I, who were who were some of the athletes when you were growing up that, you know, you idolized or just you you watched with that, that amazement? Yeah, I would say in basketball, it was definitely Michael Jordan. Uh, you know, I mean, that's a cliche answer, but, you know, I got to see him when I was in, you know, when I was 10 and 11 and 12, I saw his last three years. So I would probably say eight to 12 years old, those five years where, um, you know, he was in his prime and then he, he actually ended in 98 when I was 12. Uh, just unbelievable what he did. You really don't understand exactly what he did till that documentary came out. Uh, the best to ever do it. And then Charles Barkley, like I said before, I loved every second about him. He was like me. He wasn't the biggest guy, but he found a way to get the rebound. Um, football, I was a big Tampa Bay Buccaneer fan. So I, I, Mike Allstott's my favorite player in football. I love him to death. He actually signed a jersey for me, uh, the A-Train, man. I appreciate it. And huge basketball fan. I love Jim Beheim, as you know. Um, you know, guys like Eton Thomas, Carmelo, and uh, Hakeem Warwick are three of my favorites, you know, growing up watching them, too. I'll I'll never forget uh, Hakeem Warwick's block on Michael Lee to to basically clinch the national championship game. I'm sure you uh, you, you enjoyed that one. Yes, we were up big. Uh, we were up like 13 points, and they made a storming comeback. Like in basketball, that's why it's a really good sport. Um, yeah, and that that was a big block. When that ball went in, we'll just never know. But his arms were. I think they touched his ankles. Man, he had the longest <laughs> arms in the world. Well, do you miss? The Big East, like the the real Big East, because I know I do. My oldest brother went to Georgetown, and so and he's like twelve years older than me. So I was like five or six, and Allen Iverson was at Georgetown, and and yet you, you know I know Tim Duncan wasn't in the uh, in the Big East, but Tim Duncan, and then in the Big East you had Ray Allen and Kerry Kittles, and I, I guess I grew up. I'm not a, like a. I went to USC, so that's the other side of the country, but I grew up a Big East basketball fan, and I just. I miss the Big East, and I, I'm curious, like, what your thoughts are on that. Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. I mean, I still talk about the Big East to this day. Even the guys that run the, even the teams like Pittsburgh were unbelievable. Um, you know, Boston College. I mean, you can you can go back and say, and people are like, oh, the ACC is the best. I'm like, listen, ACC would not be the best if the Big East was still. It was a team at the bottom echelon or not. It was. You're on your toes and you're trying to will them to win. I mean, you know, those games were unbelievable. Whenever Georgetown played Syracuse, I mean, uh, at the Carrier Dome, it's just something special. And, uh, you know, like you said, Villanova, St. John's, Eric Barkley. I mean, they, they had so many guys and um, it was it's, it was spectacular. I, uh, it's a real shame that we still don't have that. I still don't have the answers to that. Some, probably something over money like usual, but we'll, we'll never know. Yeah. Uh, all right, so I want to get into your your little league baseball experience. Before we get to the the stuff that everyone probably remembers or knows about, I, I read that you had an unfortunate incident uh, prior to that when you were, I think, maybe pitching, or I I don't know what it was, but it involved your pants. Uh, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing some of that story. Listen, <laughs> I don't tell this to many. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was I was in our what was it I'm gonna think here I think it was our ten year old tournament we made it to the final game and you only go to the sectional uh, in your ten year old tournament and uh, God Almighty I can't believe you're bringing this up but um, <laughs> yeah I, I was playing shortstop and uh, thank God we had black pants because I, I really I I had to go to the bathroom number two and uh, I couldn't hold it in you know the bottom line was. I, I didn't want to leave the field and let my team out to drive. We were winning. We were up, we were up three, uh, four at the time, and our pitcher gave up another one down three, down two. And the coach, you know, I, I already, already, you know, crapped my pants already. And he calls me in the pitch, and I'm like, oh, my God. So I'm tippy Tony. Is you all right? I'm like, yeah, yeah. I took one warm-up pitch, and I said, I'm ready to go. And the umpire came up. He said, oh, my God, what's that smell? And I'm like, listen, 
I don't know why I said this. I said, listen, I came up to the mountain. I smell the same damn thing. I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> Base is loaded two outs. If I get one out, we win. The guy hits the base clearing triple. We lose by one. Um, you know, it's the way the story goes. I ran to the Porter John as fast as possible. Johnny on the spot. My dad's laughing at me. I mean, it made for a funny ride home because everybody else is crying and I was just happy to get the hell out of there. <laughs> All right, well, I think I, I think you ended up making good on on Little League success. So, uh, you're a few years older than me, and and I haven't yet shared this with you, but I was a huge Tom's River Todd Frazier fan. I was like every year, like when I was six years old on, I would look forward to the Little League World Series, and then here's this guy Todd Frazier. He plays short, he pitches, he hits home runs, he's the leadoff hitter, like he does everything. Uh, and and you guys end up winning the Little League World Series. So I guess my first question, just generally speaking, what was that particular experience like for you, and and maybe how important was it for you to experience? Yeah, it was uh, it was pretty much the start of my baseball career. You know, I my brother went in '95, and my biggest thing was when I turned 12 in '98. That was that's what I wanted to do. I had two guys come with me to watch my brother play, and. Uh, I said, listen, guys, man, this is us. We love pin training. We got to meet up with different players, younger kids. And, you know, when we turned 12, all of a sudden, you know, we, we, we clicked again. Uh, we won every tournament we went to except for the 10-year-old one because of my fault. But other than that, <laughs> you know, we had, we had a lot of lucky breaks. But still, we knew what we what kind of team we had and we knew what we needed to do. I mean, it was, it was something special. We wanted to just make it the way for them. We made it there. Uh, we kept winning, and we're like, dude, we got a chance to win this whole thing, and eventually we did. And playing in front of forty thousand people every game up there kind of helped me out with the pressures of playing in front of a big crowd, and um, you know, it came natural to me. Yeah. So you're you're playing in front of forty thousand. There are I don't know how many people watching on TV. I mean, you're you're playing on on ESPN. Were you guys just having so much fun that you didn't even think about it? Was there like, did you have to adjust to the pressure at some point, or? Like, what was that like? Because I, I can't even fathom, you know, what it would be like at that age to have that sort of attention and spotlight on you. You know, I'd like to give credit to, you know, not only our coaches, but our parents. Our parents weren't any parents that were like, oh, you got to play my son. What are you doing? You know, there was no complaints. And I think, you know, from that standpoint on, when our manager, Mike Gator, understood that, that our parents just want us to have fun, whether they're playing three innings and getting one a bat or playing all six innings. We knew we had something special, and we parents got along. The coaches got along with the parents and the players. There wasn't any animosity, and, um, you know, that's basically what it was. In every practice, we always had a fun game we played at the end, and uh, whether it was a home run derby or ground ball game, if you bobble the ball, you lose. So we they always made it serious in the beginning, but fun at the end, and I think that's what sports is about, not only just baseball, but you got to make it fun for the kids, and that's definitely what we did. Did you, and, and, and whether it's you specifically, because you were, you know, the, the, the star player on that team or, or just the team in general, did you guys realize that, you know, for that, I don't know, a, a, a few week window and maybe a little bit after that you guys were uh, national celebrities of some sort? Like, did that, did you have any of those moments where like, holy smokes, like, I can't believe that, you know, these people actually know who we are. Dude, it was nuts because we, we knew. We knew there was crowds and crowds watching us. I mean, we had a great following, but we at, at 12, 11, and 12-year-olds didn't understand what we were getting into, um, especially once we, we won and we were driving home. We had a we had a parade, and I'm telling you right now, I, I, there was probably 30, 40,000 people up and down in Tom's River cheering us on, so happy to see us, and people were coming back and following us. We were on a fire. Um, what were we on? Um, oh, my God. Fire truck and it was just unbelievable. I mean, the letters I got from all over the world, people saying thank you, man, uh, just helping people out across the world over a, a crazy game of baseball um, that people don't understand, like how much baseball can impact the world. And um, you know, that's another story we got going on right now. But you know, it, it, we didn't really understand it. We went on the Rose O'Donnell show. We went to bat uh, the dinner that um, that we went to and. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it was pretty. It was pretty cool, and we understood afterwards what we got into, but not definitely not during. 
how how close are you still with with some of the guys? If I'm not mistaken, you you played at Rutgers with Casey Gaynor, uh, but you know it, it, that team in general. Do you keep in touch with with a lot of the guys? Just some. Uh, what what's the relationships like nowadays? Yeah, I, I I talk to you know probably three or four guys. I would say mainly three. Um, you know, I don't know what everybody's doing, but we we definitely have a reunion every five years or, or at least every 10 years. We try to have our reunion and uh, we came on our 20th, what was it? Our 20th year reunion on, in 2018 coming up on 25 in 2023. So um, yeah, it, it's great. You know, now we can have a couple of root beers and joke around, you know, at a bar or restaurant and have a little fun, but yeah, everybody's doing great. It seems like, and uh, you know, the respect we have on, and when we talk about it, it's like those old stories you talk about with your cronies, you know, if you're, you know, whatever you did, it, it always brings a smile to your face. And, you, and once somebody says something about something, another guy remembers something about another, and it makes it for fun time. Uh, all right. Now, switching gears, I don't know if this was before or after how old you were, but I, I read that you were a carnival barker. Uh, how did that, how did you get uh, roped into that? And, and what were those experiences like? Because, I, it seems like that would be a great, like a, that's a match made in heaven for you. Listen, that was, that was my first real job. I mean, my first real job was at a young kid. I would get, uh, what was it, $3 an hour. I remember I was, I was really young, like five or six. I would uh, take newspapers and put them in plastic so the next day my neighbor could throw them outside. That's back in the day, day when, you know, people hand-delivered the, the newspapers. But for me, um it was a carnival barber, basically. So I, I don't think we don't call them carnival barbers here in Jersey because we're, we work on the boardwalk. So I guess, you know, either boardwalk barkers or, you know, I, I work on a boardwalk uh, doing the wheel or, you know, my first job was with the basket, the basketball. And the rims weren't fully round, per se. <laughs> <laughs> but the owner said, listen, the more people you get, the more you talk, you know, you get extra money at the end of the, at the, end of the day. So, well, wow, that, that's easy for me. You know, and I give the old check it out, try it out. One month. here, are you with the, you with the, you know, with the, what are those teeth, those tank top t-shirts? Right, come over here, man. Show your girl what you got, and then you know, you, that's how you rope them in. And the guy's like, oh man, you're you're funny. I'm not paying that. I'm like, here, come over here, and I'll show you how to make one. And I make one in. They're like, oh, I can do that. I said, all right, well, three dollars for two, blah blah blah. And I went through the spiel. Next thing you know, he's twenty dollars out of his pocket. <laughs> And I'm and I'm making and I'm making more money at the end. So when you got a gift of gab, and uh, you know how to reel somebody in, man, you you bring me to one of those uh, those markets, those flea markets, and with twenty dollars, I'll come home with fifteen things, uh, <laughs> and uh, you'll be very happy. <laughs> I, so Todd, you you went to uh, you went to Rutgers, and it, it seems like you've got a ton of pride in in, in where you're from, your roots, and and obviously. The, the part of the world where you're from, I, I think a lot of people tend to have uh, a pride in, in that. Where did that come from for you? Where did the, the pride in, in New Jersey and, and, you know, being an East coast guy, how, how did that develop? How, how did that become important to you? Yeah, I think it started from growing up. My mom and dad always said, you know, don't, don't forget your family. Don't forget your roots. Um, you know, not only play for your family, but play for the people that back you up and everybody here in New Jersey. You know, you're going to have your, your, your haters every once in a while, but everybody here in Jersey seems to have everybody's back. You know, we live in a town where everybody knows everybody and everybody treats everybody like family. We root for each other. Um, you know, if you're from New Jersey and you're playing baseball, man, I, I hope the best for you even more. I mean, I love, love everybody from this state. Um, we have a chip on our shoulders, man. Everybody thinks we're that little that armpit of, of the world when, you know, we're, we're some of the toughest people you ever meet. So for us, you know, we, we like that chip on our shoulder. You know, we can't play baseball 24-7, you know, 365. And, uh, you know, when all of a sudden we have somebody, a scout or somebody's watching, but, hey, where's that guy from Jersey? Oh, no, he's, you know, those guys are tough up there. You know, and we are, we are, you know, whether people like to believe it or not. We, you know, we play with that chip and, um, you know, that emotion every day. And that's something, you know, me, Mike Trout, uh, Rick Sello, to name a couple people, Sean Doolittle, to name a few uh I'm stuck with, and uh, we don't forget where we're from. All right, your your first big league home run came against Barry Zito. What do you remember about that? Yeah, man, I remember he had a nasty curveball. I hit the home run off his curveball. I remember he's a Cy Young Award winner. Um, 
Uh, it, it was awesome. I think it went like in the second, first or second row. I mean, I didn't care. I just wanted to get it out of the way. It was a really cool moment to hit it off a guy like that who, uh, who was really superior in the game of baseball during his time. And, uh, it was in Cincinnati. It was hot. And, uh, you know, it was the culmination of all the hard work you put into this game. And uh, I, I, was just, I was ecstatic because, you know, I got my RBIs out of the way. I, I, I got – you know, everything else. And I, it was, I think it was my 22nd at bat. I finally got the home run, and I was I was really, really excited. So it, it, those, those times were fun. They they crushed me in the locker room after the game with, <laughs> uh, with a beer bath and mustard and ice cream and shaving cream. So it was uh, – those memories I'll never forget. I don't know if you're a collector, but do you – well, I guess, first of all, are you a collector? And, and, and second, do you have anything from that, you know, to, to commemorate the first home run or anything like that? Yeah, I have. I have pretty much everything in mind that it's called. I mean, you know, for example, I have, uh, you know, the bat I use, the gloves, uh, the jersey. Uh, I have a jersey for every team I've played with. Um, I'm a big, big collector in cleats, signed cleats, game used or not. I have probably over 60 or 70 cleats from guys that are, you know, either Hall of Famers, guys I love playing against, or, you know, you know guys I played with. And then, like, something little is, um, I think last year I hit my 200th home run and it was at Wrigley Field and I asked the grounds crew if he can give me the third base so I can hang that in my man cave and the, you know, tomorrow I came in and the base was sitting right there. So little things like that I collect and, um, you know, I can always tell my son, Hey, what's this base for? Well, your daddy hit his 200th home run at Wrigley Field, buddy. And, you know, hopefully in 20, 30 years, that's still there. It'd be pretty cool. What's your most prized possession in that man cave? Oh man, yeah, I'd have to go down there. I think a, a, a different one. I, I'll give you a couple examples. Something that I don't think many people have. I have a uh, uh, Rudy Rudiger signed jersey, like the original Notre Dame jersey that they wore. Yeah, uh, I think that that's pretty cool. I got Paul O'Neill signed cleat. He was my favorite player growing up too. Um, oh boy, what kind of difference do I have down there? Hey, you caught me off guard here. I got a Mike Tyson signed. Um, oh, all right, all right. So I got Mike Tyson signed boxing glove, but I think the one and another unique one I got. So Joey Chestnut came to New York, and I looked in the garbage can. I was looking for one of those Nathan hot dog um, covers that covers the hot dog, and I found one in the, in, the, in the garbage. I picked it up and said, Joe, before you leave, you sign this for me. <laughs> for me. So that, that's a cool piece of uh, that I have, so you'd have to come down and check it out. I have old baseball gloves. I have, you know, my home run derby trophies down there. Um, so I, I have a unique little, uh, you know, not overbearing of stuff, but just stuff that's uh, really near and dear to my heart. All right, so we'll get to the home run derby in a second, uh, but it seems like you've hit some some big home runs. The, the leadoff home run uh, in the Little League World Series, we, you know, we just talked about your first big league home run which happened to be against, the, as you mentioned, a Cy Young award-winning pitcher. Uh, you hit a home run one day, and then that night you saved someone's life. I, I you know, I, I was curious. I, I know you've talked about that a million times, but would you mind sharing that story of, of how that all came about in a restaurant? Yeah, that was uh, crazy. I remember uh, Ryan Ludwig. He said, Frazier, I'm going to take you out to dinner, man. You deserve it. You've been having a good series. I said, all right, man. He, he was one of my mentors growing up. And uh, we went to the Capitol Grill in Pittsburgh. And it was, you know, just me and him at the bar. Nobody, you know, really around. It was kind of dead at the time. And I looked to my right. There's a couple there. And um, next thing you know, I'm, I turned around. I said, oh, my God. You know, Luddy, listen. Or look, this guy's choking me. I'm going over. He said, go, go, go. So I went over. And two waitresses, two ladies were trying to give him the Heimlich more. This guy was a little heavier. And... Um, they couldn't get it out of him. I said, move. So I got there. I couldn't get my arms around him. So I gave him two Heimlich maneuver pumps as hard as I could. And, you know, you think about when you give somebody Heimlich, you think about, you know, bug funny and, you know, the food, you know, spitting out of their mouth and going 10 feet from the, you know, in distance. But, you know, it came up, he caught it in the bag of his mouth, took it out. And uh, he was very thankful. He ended up buying our dinner, which I said I really didn't need to do. And, uh, that's pretty much what it was. Never heard from the guy since, and um, probably will never hear from him again. Hopefully he's doing great. All right, another home run, and this one was really cool for me. Uh, you know, I have a, I have a charity for, for people with disabilities, and you formed a relationship with Teddy Kramer, who was uh, 
uh, a young man in Cincinnati with uh, with Down syndrome, if if my memory's correct, and uh, was around the team, and and then one day was you know the honorary bat boy, and I think you you promised you'd hit him a home run, or, or you know it was one of those kind of fairy tale type conversations, and lo and behold, you end up uh, hitting that home run. I, how, how did that relationship all develop? And, and I'm curious because for me, Todd, with the the charity work I do, I always say that. You know, I, I take away so much from from those individuals because they've never had a bad day in their life. They are the happiest people in the world. I, I'm just curious what that experience was like for you and, and maybe some of your takeaways. Yeah, I mean, for me, first off, growing up, there was a thing called Team Randy, my buddy's dad who ran it for years. Uh, um, Mr. Uh, Billy Wilbur, um, you know, he, he ran the same thing. He'd bring kids in a bus and uh, bring them to the boardwalk or to a water park or a bowling alley, and, you know, it was like once a month they'd always do it, and I, I, I did it a handful of times. And it, it was just a really good experience because you sit on that bus, these kids are laughing, and they are just having such a good time. And, and for some reason, you just sit back and you're like, you reflect like, man, I'm, I'm worried about the littlest things as a high schooler, and these kids are just having the times of their life, you know, picking up a bowling ball and throwing it down the alley or, you know, going down a slide where, you know, uh, you know, two or three year old goes down and they are just having so much fun. And I, you know, that meant something to me. And it was something that I've always wanted to be a part of with kids like that. I used to do, well, I still do a lot of baseball functions with special needs. I have a thing called Field of Dreams that's coming up. It'll be open soon at Tom's River um, with Christian Kane. His son was had a big accident, you know, four or five years ago. And he, he, he vied to himself that I'm going to, I'm going to make something really big happen here. And, He's done a heck of a job uh, with his son, Gavin. And then we're going to have a field of dreams, and I'm going to be a big part of that. I've donated a lot of money into that. And, you know, and then Teddy Kramer came along in Cincinnati, and, uh, you know, he's an honorary bad boy once a year. Uh, he was 33 at the time when he got Down syndrome. And he'd always say, Todd, I love you. I gave him my wristband. He said, man, he said, Todd, hit me a home run. I said, all right, I got you. And it was on video, and I was like, I don't remember. And then I hit the home run. I get home. We were up like a lot of runs. I didn't want to show the picture up, but he gave me a bear hug and, you know, the rest was history. So now we became really good friends and uh, I saw him uh, last year in Cincinnati and gave him a big hug and kiss. And uh, those kids are just the best in the world. It makes me feel uh, even better, you know, knowing that I can, I can help them out for sure. That's a, that's a really special story. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Got it. All right. The home run derby, Cincinnati. Uh, you know, it's always cool. I, I used to love my favorite part growing up of the all-star game or the home run derby was hearing the reactions of the crowds when everyone was introduced. And maybe if it was in a rival city, you know, a player would get, you know, you could hear like a smattering of booze, but it it was also really cool when the hometown guy got introduced or the guys and, uh, and you got to win a home run derby in your, your home city at the time. I I mean, just winning a home run derby is, is super cool in and of itself. But I mean, here you are again, coming up in a, in a big spot and, in delivery, what, what was that experience like for you? Oh, it was awesome. You know, I had my family there as well. My brother Charlie threw to me. My brother Jeff, I called him my hype man. He's on the sideline. <laughs> telling me, you know, you got this. You know, breathe. You know, let's go, let's go. I could hear him like it was, you know, like it was yesterday. And the fans kind of willing me to win, man. I was so tired. That was the first time we had that format. So that'll, that'll go down in history. That's pretty cool, I think. And, uh, you know, I just knew that I wasn't going to lose that one because first is in my home park. And second, uh, you know, Jock Peterson, my good friend, man, I told him I'm not letting this youngster beat me. So it was fun. It was great. I, I hope I gave the fans there at Cincinnati something to love because every time I go back, they give me love no matter what. You know, I tried to give my heart to that city too as well. It was really cool. All right, one, one thing I want to ask you about, uh, your the way you grip the bat. And, and I, if I'm not mistaken, I think you've got, you know, bigger than normal hands so that, that maybe changes what you have to do versus someone else. But but how how would you explain the way you grip your bat and, and how did you get to that point? I mean, who were some of the influences or, or how what was like the evolution of finding the, 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 the grip that works best for you? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a really good question. Man. Nobody's ever asked me that. I kind of have my pinky over the bottom of the knob, you know, two strikes. I might choke up a little bit, but for me... Um, you know, I feel more whippy, you know, that whippy action. And baseball guys can understand, like, when you come through the zone, you get that whip action. Uh, if you hold it a little lower, um, you know, guys have been doing it for years now, but, you know, it seems kind of not been happening. You know, just for me, 
it's, it's all about comfort. I think everybody understands that, you know, not only in baseball, but in life. You know, you have to be comfortable in what you do. And that's my comfort zone. So, you know, if you throw it in the area where I'm ready to rock and my hands are in the right place, the ball's going to go, you know, it's going to be hit hard at least or go far away. So, um, you know, it's all about comfort that day, and you go from there. Uh, all right. I want to ask you about the injury you suffered in Arlington a few years ago. And, and in my perspective from the booth, I was in between. So you, for people who aren't familiar, you go and, and you, you basically give up your body on the third base side on a foul ball and, and hit your head, uh, and, and, and cut yourself and, you know, kind of actually like a pretty scary thing. You know, if you didn't know exactly what was wrong, uh, and you know, I, I look after a half inning on Twitter, and, and someone's asked, uh, you know, how how's Todd Frazier? And I say, you know, I don't know, waiting to hear. And then someone else chimed in uh, saying, well, Hawk Harrelson said he's okay. And I'm like, well, that's great. But, uh, you know, I appreciate that that Hawk's a doctor. But, I, you know, let, let's wait and see. He's like, no, like Hawk went down. And, like, I've never, you know, as a broadcaster, it's, and, and Hawk's a little different, and, and uh, you know, he's got the the years or had the years, certainly, and the ties to, you know, to that team. But it's just crazy that Hawk Harrelson went down and uh, actually checked on you. I always get a kick out of that. But, uh, yeah. you know, I think you've been pretty healthy throughout your career. What, what I mean, what was that? that? Was that, like, a scary thing? Did you know right away you were okay? What was that all about? Yeah, basically, you know, Prince Fielder hit that ball, and it was really windy, I remember that day. The ball was taken out. When you hit the ball, it was going right to left field. So, <clears throat> for me, uh, I was shifting, and I knew eventually once I got close, I'm going to have to dive in the sand to try and catch it. So, I dove in. I knocked the guy over, and my face went right to the, the corner of the chair he was sitting at. I'm like, oh, man. So, I kind of felt with my tongue, and next thing you know, my I felt my tongue go through my lip, and I'm like, oh, no, this ain't good. Kind of freaked out a little bit, covered the glove because blood was everywhere, um, and it was just it would have been horrific. You know, I didn't want any kids to see me bleeding everywhere, so I covered it up, went in the dugout, and um, you know, they they calmed me down. I'm like, all right, I think I'm ready to go back in. They're like, no, actually, I forgot I had my tongue through my lip. And I look, Todd, there's a hole in your lip the size of a nickel, and it was. We got stitches right away. I mean, the, the Rangers were gracious, really gracious to doing that for me right away once I got uh, the stitches out. And, uh, yeah, Hawk did come down. That's my dog. I love Hawk Carrollson, man. He, uh, you know, people don't understand how nice of a guy he is, um, you know, how understanding he is. You know, I know people were making fun of the whole thing, you know, the, especially the Cubs fans because that's what fans do. So uh, I talked to him, you know, before, um, you know, I left, and he's doing good, enjoying life. And, uh you know, it was a freak accident, you know, good story to tell, but um, I wish I didn't get hurt because I was really tearing it up that series, too, if you remember. <laughs> I do. It seems like, uh, <laughs> I think there was a, gosh, was it was it an extra inning game or maybe the Rangers made a late comeback or something, and I think you hit a, a home run in extras to essentially win the game and it wasn't a walk-off because right, it was in well, Arlington? I was, I was four for six, grand slam, and two home runs, man. It was crazy. Yeah, no, I, trust me, I remember that. Uh Hey, you got to work with uh, some some really good broadcasters there too, uh, or play on on teams with with Hawk, and then a, a guy that we've talked about, my mentor and and your good friend Jason Benetti. Uh, yeah, Todd, I'm, I'm curious. You know, you you got three kids. Uh, you're obviously you know families. Not to say it's not for other people, but you know it's 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 super important for you, and and not just family, but the community that you're a part of, as you talked about. How do you balance the demands of being a professional baseball player? And being a dad and, and a husband and, and even a friend, you know, I think people always say, well, what's it like being balancing that and being a dad and being a husband, but, but also a, a friend, how do you balance all that? Yeah, it's tough. It's, it's really tough because you know, I'm not home all the time. So for me, I always tell myself, you know, be a better dad every day. Try and be a better dad. You know, be a better husband. And, um, you know, some days are better than others, but you know, when you're home, you try and make up for the lost days. And then when they come to the park, you try and do as much as you can with the kids. And for me, I, I taught that, for, or I learned that from my dad. You know, I watched him how he raised us, and I tell my mom every day, "I'm sorry for all the things I used to do back in the day. Now I'm reaping the benefits per se from my kids doing it." So, you know, it's a learning experience. There's no rule book. There's no book that says, "Listen, you have to do this. You have to do that." You know, you can raise your kids the way you want, but you need to raise them the right way too, as well. You know, learn 
what's going on in the world and uh, and also let them make their own decisions as they get older, I think. And then I'm a big believer in, you know, letting them do what they have to do. And then if it's wrong or if they made a mistake, you know, teach them, hey, listen, you know, why did you do that? You know, and they give you an answer and then you explain them what the right way to do so they can learn for themselves. So um, we'll see as they grow up and uh, hopefully they become a great um, gentleman and a great lady too as well. All right. One of the things, Ty, two more questions, we'll let you go. Uh, and I, I certainly appreciate it. But, uh, you know, one of the things that, that has always followed you around is is your clubhouse presence. And people always talk about how, you know, you know, forget what positive contributions you make on the field that, you know, you are such a positive person to have a part of a clubhouse. And I'm just curious, you know, I, I think communication and, and leadership, that stuff all fascinates me because there's it's not objective. There's not like a you know, one plus one equals two in all cases. What are what are the things that are important to you uh, in, in being a positive influence in the clubhouse and, and being a leader and, 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 you know, whether you choose to or it just kind of falls on you having those responsibilities? Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, as in, there's two different types of leaders. Leaders that, you know, are quiet and show and prove it on the field that, you know, look, you can follow me or get the heck out of the way or, there's leaders that are vocal and, you know, I, I'm a big vocal guy. You know, I'm a big believer in, you know, not showing somebody up, you know, take them to the side and explain it to them. Listen, you know, this is, you know, we need to do this or, you know, like I said before, what, what was your thought process, on, you know, going to that extra base or making that, you know, wrong choice that you did, you know, to explain, I think nowadays with guys coming up, the more you explain and not show them up, I think the better off they'll be. But there's also a time where you need, you know, to tell them right away, like, you know, that's, you know, that's wrong. And, you know, it's that constructive criticism I, that I, that kids, some of them don't understand nowadays, but, you know, you need that too as well, you know. So for me, it, it's also a learning experience. You know, I make mistakes too, don't get me wrong, but it, it, as a leader and a good clubhouse presence, it's also good to have fun. But, you know, there's serious time too as well, especially when it comes to your profession. All right, last thing for me. Earlier you talked about in your man cave, you've got cleats, uh, you know, from, you know, teammates, uh, opponents, people you respect, what have you. I I'm curious, you've been on a few teams, you've played with some tremendous players, you've you've certainly played against some tremendous players. Who are some people that you've uh, played with or against who, for whatever criteria is important to you, impressed you or or currently impress you whether it's you know their ability the way they go about things just who they are off the field as people who are some of the and, and not to limit this because i'm sure you've got you know a long list and and I, I i hate for you to you know put you in a position to leave someone out but like who are the people that just jump to the top of your mind when you think about that yeah um shoot i mean mike trout's definitely on, t <clears throat> on top of my list for sure he's a guy that leads by example you know, doesn't really talk much, but he'll lead for sure. Um, Nolan Arenado, I mean, the way he plays the game, uh, <clears throat> falls to the wall. You know, he plays definitely for the love of the game. Um, God, Jacob DeGrom, too, he's a bulldog out there. There's just, there, I mean, there's a whole list of guys that I can go through from top to bottom. They always have qualities, but, you know, those three are definitely guys that I look up to um, and that, you know, I love facing because I know, you know, it's going to be a war. It's going to be a battle. So for me, those three guys are, are top dogs. I lied. I got one one quick one. As a from sports fan to sports fan, uh, if you had the ability to talk to someone dead or alive and ask them one question, and you're guaranteed to get an honest response, is there like a burning question you have as a sports fan that you'd like to ask someone and just find out what went down or, or what was this all about or just the truth to something? Yeah, maybe. I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is, uh, uh, oh, man, the, the, the Black Sox scandal. Maybe go and talk to that team and be like, hey, man, what was, you know, what was your thought process? You know, how did this unfold? And, you know, just maybe ask. I think that would be pretty cool because that was such a big uh, big story back in the day. I don't know why that was the first thing that came to my mind, but I'm sure I have something better, but. It might take about five minutes. We don't have that much time. <laughs>